Hello students, welcome back to another episode of Principles of Micro. Today we are in chapter three. This is an extremely important chapter. I could even say without exaggeration, the most important chapter of this course. This tells you about supply and demand analysis and that is probably your biggest takeaway from Principles of Micro. So what you'll be able to do at the end of this chapter is be able to look at some economic story in the news and make predictions about how it's going to affect price and how it's going to affect quantity. So this is a very big deal. So first we'll go over some market basics. Then we'll introduce the demand side. We'll see what conditions can cause demand to change in section three here. After that, we'll move on to talk about supply. Supply can also change under some conditions. We'll learn about what those conditions are. Lastly, we'll put supply and demand together to talk about the market equilibrium. So every market has two sides, supply and demand. Demand comes from consumers. So in most markets, you're on a demand side. The main exception is the labor market. In the labor market, you provide, you supply labor, so we are suppliers in the labor market. Producers are on the supply side, so um, firms trying to sell goods are suppliers. Now, the price and quantity is jointly determined by both supply and demand. The producer does not dictate the price. So that's an important misconception to be aware of. If the supplier could just dictate the price, they make, say, a banana cost $1,000, but then nobody would buy it if it were $1,000. So $1,000 can't be the equilibrium price for a banana. Consumers have input on that, and they can just choose not to buy if the price is too high. So for notation, You'll see us a lot, not just in this class, but also in other econ classes. We typically use P for price and Q for quantity. So the amount of competition in a market is going to be an important factor in our analysis. For now, we'll look at two main cases, but we'll later break it down to four. So the first case of study is perfect competition. That's where you have tons and tons of buyers and tons and tons of sellers. Each individual buyer and seller is so small that they can't really influence the price on their own. So your book calls that a competitive market. The more common term you'll see in most other books is perfect competition. Now, a competition that truly is perfect is kind of rare. Um, a close example out there is a farmer's market. There are lots and lots of small farmers. No single one of them can influence price significantly. There are also lots and lots of buyers at the farmer's market. Each one of them is too small to have much of an impact on price either. So the other broad category is called imperfect competition. So either the buyer or the seller can influence price. Now there are degrees of imperfect competition. So on one extreme end, there is the monopoly. So the publisher, W.W. W. Norton in this case, has a monopoly on your textbook. That's why textbooks are so expensive. It's monopoly pricing. You either get the book or you fail the class. So you pay the price even if it's something outrageously high like $200 for a book. So monopolies are an extreme case of imperfect competition, though a true monopoly like that is kind of rare. A lot of times you see industries where there is somewhat imperfect competition, but it's not monopoly level. So with airlines, for example, there's more than one airline. However, 
the market's limited to a, num a small number of big firms, so each firm has a fair amount of influence over price. With cars, you have a bit more competition. You have, well, it's still a small handful of brands out there and car makers, so they have some influence over price. Another example of imperfect competition is restaurants. So there is a wide variety of restaurants out there. However, each restaurant is a little bit different. So you might have a favorite and you could want to pay a little bit extra to go to your favorite restaurant. So they have a weak ability to influence price, but it is some influence over the market outcome. There's a range of possibilities for imperfect competition. We'll study that in more depth later on. So we call the firm's ability to influence price its market power. So when there is perfect competition, nobody can influence price. That means that there's no market power. Every firm, every individual has zero market power. When there is imperfect competition, now there is some market power. That market power be maximized in the case of the monopoly. Now, there is another scenario to be aware of here. I talked about market power mostly coming on the supply side. There are some cases where you can see market power on the demand side. So one case is known as a monopsony. That's not a misspelling. That really is a word. <coughs> That's a market where there's only one buyer. So monopoly, it means one seller. Monopsony, one buyer. So I call it a rare case because it's actually kind of hard to think of examples. The one case I could think of was with military equipment. So the government is not going to let your firm sell military equipment to an enemy country. So you only sell equipment to the government, so there's only one buyer. So in that case, the buyer has a lot of influence over price. So that wraps up our section on market basics. Be sure to tune in for our next episode, and we'll talk about demand.